In our last episode, we learned that being a good husband means learning to live the crucified life. It means learning to die to yourself in order to meet the needs of your wife and help bring her closer to God. But that comes against one of the biggest sins that a man struggles with after years of giving himself over to sexual sin. I'm talking about selfishness. A man who's practiced in indulging his fleshly lusts and giving himself everything he wants is going to struggle with selfishness, even if he is sincerely repenting. And sometimes he's not even going to be aware of it. That was Steve Gallagher's story. Even after he was done with sexual sin and even after he had founded and established Pure Life Ministries, he still found himself filled with a level of selfishness which deeply hurt his wife, Kathy. And it took a lot of humbling and a lot of dying to self for God to transform him. In this episode, we look at what it means for a husband to learn to be selfless. Pastor Steve, I really appreciate you being with us today um, to take the time to talk about this because I know that this advice is going to be helpful because it's coming out of your testimony. Um, At one time, you were completely unfaithful to Kathy, and you had to learn how to grow in being a godly husband. Um, So I want to start off by asking you, what was the biggest obstacle um, to being a good husband when you first came out of sexual sin? Well, just in a general uh, sense, it was my self-centeredness. You know, I had completely given myself over to sexual sin for years. Mm -hmm. I had dug such a pit for myself in Mm -hmm. indulging sin. And, you know, the more you give over to it, the more self-centered you become. So uh, as Kathy and I were working on restoring our marriage— that was that didn't just go away, you mm-hmm. know. That was something that took a long time for um, that to diminish. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, as I started becoming less self-focused, mm-hmm. then I was able to love her. Mm-hmm. And you know, it was just a gradual transition. I think about those early times, um, and I've heard Kathy talk about them a lot. How painful and difficult it was for her. And one of the things that she's expressed a lot is that that came from the um, uncertainty of would you keep going with the Lord or would you just fall um, right back into the same patterns that you'd been in before? Um, So I'm wondering, how were you able to keep yourself from returning to your sin? Well, definitely the Lord had his hand on my life. And, you know, um, May of 85 was the last time I was with another person. Uh, And... I knew that something had changed in Mm -hmm. me. I was at a massage parlor, and when I walked out of there, I knew I won't do this again, Mm -hmm. you know. So I definitely experienced the change, but it doesn't mean that I was beyond the reach of the enemy, Okay, you know, after that. So I was definitely still vulnerable. But um, right at that point, uh, I was entering Bible school, Mm -hmm. and not long after that, starting Pure Life. And so I was so busy Mm -hmm. and so locked in on getting through Bible Mm -hmm, school mm -hmm. and getting this ministry going Mm -hmm. that I really didn't have time to think about the sin. Right. So I wasn't sitting around, Mm -hmm. you know, idle hands or the devil's workshop. Mm -hmm. I just was not idle. Um, But having said all that, you know, for those listening, I would just say uh, the Lord's got something for you to be involved Mm -hmm. in, figure out what it is, and give give yourself to it. Mm -hmm. And instead of thinking in terms of what can I— do for myself, Mm -hmm. get out of yourself and start focusing on others. God's got something he's calling you to do. And um, if you'll just give yourself over to that, I have a feeling it would be very powerful in uh, your battle with sin. Yeah, that's good because I think about how much we need to keep pursuing the Lord after we've come, you know, it's still a journey. And if people just want to go, okay, I've got my sin taken care of. Now I, now I can go back to my normal life. They're going to fall. They're going to have those opportunities to fall back into sin. 
Whereas if they keep pursuing the Lord and he's their main focus, then he's going to put in front of them those things like you're talking about. Yeah, and it's his desire to do it. He says that he wants to do that. And um, yeah, it's better to replace the sin with something positive than to just leave a vacuum there. Hmm. I think that's good, and I like the kind of the broader picture you're painting, but I'd like to bring it more into focus of what um, your marriage looked like and how that self-centeredness played out in your marriage um, during those early days. Could you talk about um, that a little bit? Yeah, I was just <laughs> such a mess. <laughs> I was so full of myself. I didn't have the wherewithal to consider my wife's needs mm-hmm. and to think about her and what would make her happy, mm-hmm. what would be a blessing to her. I was just so out of it. Uh, but I grew in that way, you know, and um, part of my problem in those early days was that, um, you know, your self-life is just reinforced through pride. Okay. Pride and self are just hand in hand. and. I was constantly going on national radio and television mm-hmm. shows, which was just boosting my ego. Right. You know, so that wasn't helping anybody. You know, we had to do it. It was the way the ministry got mm-hmm. started, and the Lord was opening those doors. Um, but things started to change when we moved to Kentucky because <laughs> all that attention and that, uh, that kind of thing started going away. Uh-huh. And then it was just the grind of ministry Mm -hmm. out here when we began the residential program. Mm -hmm. Uh, And one day I um, said something to Kathy. Just in passing, I told her I loved her. Mm -hmm. And she, apparently I had (laughs) done something before. But anyway, she said, don't tell me you love me. You don't treat me like you love me. And it was, we had kind of a, well, it was totally one-sided blow up. She just finally got fed up with my uh-huh. sharp tongue because I was just hard on her. Uh-huh. You know, I was demanding, I was intense, and she just exploded that day. But something really happened for us that mm. particular day because uh, I really saw how I was affecting her. Mm. And uh, from that day on, things definitely got better in our marriage. That was 1970, no, 1990, what am I saying? That was 1990. Wow. Have you seen that play out in guys that you've ministered to over the years? Kind of a similar situation. They'll go home, they'll kind of still be living in some of the same flow, and then just the Lord will bring it to a head and bring a situation that really opens their eyes. Yeah, well, the Lord is happy to use anything he can possibly use to get our attention and to lead us in the right direction. And a lot of times, uh, let's just say that he's, there's no shortage of ammunition for him uh-huh. with a man who's coming out of sexual sin because uh-huh. he is just going to be constantly doing something wrong, hurting his wife, whatever, wow. and she is going to be reacting to it. So there's going to be plenty of those opportunities, typically. Hmm. So I know you've talked about um, repentance playing out, taking a long time to work into a person. So did that argument, did that spark a huge change in you, or did it continue like a lot of other things you've expressed um, on this podcast to just work itself out over time? Yeah, it was both. Um, The change was mainly in the way I interacted with Kathy. Mm -hmm. I was more careful in the the way that I spoke to her after that. You know, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I saw how how I had hurt her, Mm -hmm. and it was real to me. So the Lord used that in that sense. But I just had to go through a lot of breaking, and the Lord was faithful to do it. You know, every time I turned around, I was being Mm -hmm. humbled or broken or disciplined, Mm -hmm. and I needed every bit of it. In fact, he really (laughs) was very patient with me. I could have, you know, uh, easily—he could have justified doing a lot more. But just to give you an example, I mean, those first couple of years of ministry here in Kentucky were really hard. Uh, We had 17 men crammed in a farmhouse (laughs) in, you know, here, our first location, and— 
and I was just so still so full of myself. Mm-hmm. And so I was continually trying to minister to these men, but mm-hmm. had my own issues. Mm-hmm. And two different occasions during those first couple of years, every man in the program walked out. Mm-hmm. You wow. know, and it was I I understood it was in large part because of me. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I mean, the reality was they they were full of themselves. They didn't want to be told anything, right. you know, all the different stuff that they had. But a large part of it was my fault, and I knew it. And it really hurt hmm. to know that I caused this or had a big hand in it. And, um, you know, but what can you do? You just got to go through it. I, I knew I couldn't quit. I had to keep going. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Lord used those things to soften me and humble me and help me in my interactions with Kathy. Yeah, I think as you talk about that, that that process, I know it was a surprise for me. It was a surprise for a lot of guys that the Lord doesn't take away all of the consequences of our sin, that the pride, the selfishness, the fear of the relationships of those around us, our wives, they... Um, it's still there, and we still have to fight through that, and that can become really discouraging. And I, I think some guys might even just want to give up or go back to the their sin to what was easy. So, what would you say um, to encourage a husband who's listening to this podcast to fight through all that and to keep persevering? I would say to just think about what you came out of, and just think about going back into that. Hmm. And the reality of of uh, going back into sin, hmm. you know, yeah, it's it's a difficult path, especially at the beginning. It gets easier and easier. It honestly does. Uh, hmm. But what's the option? Hmm. You know, you're going to go back into sin. You're going to break away from God. You're going to break away from the things of God. Mm-hmm. You're going to head back into darkness hmm. and spend the rest of your days in darkness hmm. with the enemy. And I don't know exactly what that um, means eternally, but hmm. it, I wouldn't want to take a chance on that. Yeah, you know who wants to even get around that cliff? Yeah. So if nothing else, uh, that should be plenty of motivation to keep fighting the fight and keep going forward. You know, because the as I've said many times, the alternatives are unthinkable. You don't want to go back there. Mm -hmm. I think that's good, that reminder to remember what we were in. But I know sometimes the devil can can cloud the bad parts of our memory and kind of begin to make it seem alluring again. How how can a guy really make sure he has a good sight of the truth about what he was in before? Well, the reality is it takes years before you can look back and really see it for what it is, because you're still so much a part of that. You're still, that is still in you. That's still real to you. Um, But, you know, we all know what it's like after you've given over to your sin and the emptiness, the the futility, the the, um, grief, the sorrow, the... Mm -hmm anger at yourself for doing it. We know what that feels like. Mm-hmm. Well, and we know what it's like, you know, when you have gotten out of it for a time, you know what it, what that existence is like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the enemy can bring back memories of sin and make them look appealing. Mm-hmm. But we need to always when that happens, we need to always uh, think in terms of yeah, that's true. But also true and more true is what comes on the heels Mm -hmm. of that little indulgence. You know, just all the, uh, man, the grief and the pain that it brings. And so, you know, yeah, we just got to keep that in mind. That makes me think about how there were some times that you you fell back um, into sin as you were fighting and learning to to repent of it. And I'm wondering, did God use um, how that affected Kathy to affect you? Did that have, I mean, an impact, um, kind of like you're talking about? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the period you're talking about was before that, 1985. The 1985 was the end of that mm-hmm. period. So you're talking about the couple of years there before that. 
Um, and yeah, I would do fine for a while, and then, you know, the enemy would bring his temptations in, and I would just fall time mm -hmm. and time again. Uh, it really started to change when we developed devotion uh, a devotional life. Okay. Then I started having the strength to overcome that. But yeah, it was one of the biggest motivators for me to fight to overcome was the way it was hurting my wife. Wow. You know, and um, just, yeah, having to tell her time after mm -hmm. time after time, I did it again. I fell again, you know, and um, it was uh, it was a help to me to mm. get keep going in the right direction. Wow. But that's a huge difference from where you'd been just a few years before that when any of your sin you couldn't care less about how it impacted her. Yeah, I was totally self-focused. And um, the day that I went through that six-hour ordeal uh, and had the gun to my head, that's what broke me as mm -hmm. a man. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where the breaking started. And, um, and that's when things started to change. And there was a lot I still had to go through, but that was a huge um, game changer for me. I often hear you exhorting our students from the pulpit when they go back home not to compromise with the world and all of the things that it can do to entice them. Um, but I think about how there's a lot of our students, their families are not on the same page um, as they are after they've been in this environment for nine months. And so how would you help a guy um, navigate between not compromising his own godly standards, but not just bowling into his family and telling him this is how it's going to be and becoming very domineering and dictatorial. Yeah, it's a difficult situation. And, you know, hopefully when a man comes to a residential program, the wife will go through the wives program because a lot of that gets dealt with in the wives program. It's, so they're both on the same page. Mm -hmm. And when he comes home, she's already on the same page mm -hmm. as him and sees the value in a godly home. Mm. Uh, but let's say, you know, that that isn't the case. She doesn't go through the program. And sometimes it's just so sad. A guy really gets it. You uh -huh. know, when he's in the residential program, he comes to the Lord, has a, a complete change in his heart and his life. He goes home full of excitement about the things of God. But the wife, maybe she wasn't, in, you know, she wasn't in sexual sin. But she's still worldly. She's still carnal. She's still on mm. that same level he was at. Mm -hmm. And um, she doesn't see anything wrong with her life because she doesn't have those sins. So it, it does make it hard for the guy. And yet, having said that, we don't want him to go home and, like you say, be dictatorial ab about these things. All I can say is he needs to sit down with her in a humble way hmm. and explain to her how the television or whatever um, creates the atmosphere that is conducive to sin hmm. and just help her to understand he's in the fight of his life yeah. and he really needs her support in this and do it in an appealing sort of way, not in a uh, demanding sort of way. Hmm. To wrap up today, we've talked primarily about kind of just how that selfishness played out in your marriage and kind of talk to guys about that. But could if you had one blanket piece of advice for a husband who's been in sin um, and who's now trying to restore his marriage, what would that piece of advice be? I think learn to appreciate what the Lord has given you in your wife. You know, just uh, begin to appreciate her. When you're given over to sin— you're doing the exact opposite of that. You're just totally into yourself, mm -hmm. and that's all you think about. But uh, as you start coming out of that, appreciation, gratitude, those are mm -hmm. things that need to be um, nourished and worked on. Mm -hmm. You have to actually work on that. One of the things we do in the residential program is give guys gratitude lists yeah. or, or assign them mm -hmm. to do a gratitude list of all the things they're grateful for because that— Gratitude brings us to contentment, which brings um, depletes the lust mm -hmm. in our lives. So there's that side to it. But also important 
is really establishing the devotional life. When your wife sees that you are on your knees every day, same time every day, you are with the Lord, you're spending time in the Word, Mm. spending time in prayer, I can't tell you Mm. how much that helps a wife to develop or to reestablish the trust. Hmm. You know, that's one of the biggest problems for wives is they have completely lost their trust for their husbands. They don't know when he's going to just go off the deep end. Mm -hmm. But when they see day in and day out uh, a husband who is really devoted to the Lord, that really, more than anything else, is what reestablishes that trust and also the respect. So, yeah, I would say those two things would be the biggest things I could share about what would really help. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being here. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. God bless you. 